Italy. I live on in Italy on the Adriatic side. Uh huh. Oh, this is yeah. That's that's really wonderful, um, and I'm sure our our listeners will 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 be delighted. Um, Mary, we got a we've got about uh, an hour to talk about about Marx, uh, his 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 wife, his best friends, his daughters, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm so glad you could join us. Mary, thank you so much. Yeah. So let's let's jump right in. Um, you know the the book uh, Love and Capital that you've just written uh, is you know is quite a substantial treatment of Marx and his entire intimate circle, his his family, and his his close friendship uh, with Frederick Engels. So let me begin by asking you, you know, why write this biography today? How does the biographical treatment of Marx? and of his family in particular address a need in the present. You know, I'm thinking, in other words, about the question of of the biographical treatment of a great revolutionary intellectual about whom, you know, so much is, is written academically, theoretically, politically. But why write biographically today? Yeah, I think I think there's there's a couple ways to answer that question, but but maybe Maybe the easiest one is is the time is kind of right now because up until 1989, maybe a few years after, it was really difficult to talk about Marx or examine his life and not have it be part of a political debate. And, you know, things have kind of calmed down in that direction, although I must say I've been surprised by some of the response to this book, you know, how really rabid some people still are about Marx, rabidly against him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and over the years, because, as you say, there's been so much written, I mean, some of it's really brilliant scholarly work, you know, very well-balanced investigating his theory, but a lot of it has been part of this Cold War battle, you know, either communists making him out to be, you know, a, a hero that he might not have been in his private life or, or in reality, and capitalists painting him to be the demon, you know, responsible for, um, you know, bloody wars from Asia to Africa to Latin America. And so somewhere, somewhere in, the, in, in all of those descriptions is the real Marx. And I thought it was time to go back and actually look at who this man was in reality, calmly and thoroughly. And to do that, I thought the best place would be, would be to place him among his family and his closest friends so that we could really be introduced to him, not as a, not as a political actor, um, we're responding to because of what happened in the 20th century, but actually who he was as a 19th century man, you know, economist, social scientist, philosopher, and, and family man. Um, and that was really what I set out to do. And, I, and I, I started the project because I was living in London, and Marx is such a still a big presence there. I mean, you actually feel, you know, you feel Dickens in London, and you also feel Marx in the same way because there's still sort of a real class consciousness there that I don't think exists so much in the United States. And I was looking for a way into his story that hadn't been done. And, and I found that out of all of the libraries of books written about Marx, mm. his life with his family really hasn't been examined. And you, you worked with a lot of material, I think, that um, has gone largely neglected. I did. I think that a lot of scholars um, looking at Marx haven't really, you know, there's, he wrote so much, and Engels, you know, his closest associate wrote so much, and there's been so much written about him that they've kind of neglected the letters, uh, the correspondence between the women in his life, his wife Jenny, his daughters, he had three daughters who survived to adulthood, their husbands, and the, and the very intimate circle around him, and it really was just a handful of people who existed in Marx's world. and. So I, I said about looking at their their correspondence to find out, you know, the intimate observations about this man on a daily basis. And there's a, a huge amount um, in the archives in Moscow. The, now it's the Russian State Archives, but it used to be the Marx, Engels, Lenin Archives. Mm -hmm. And also in Amsterdam, there's a really interesting social history library there that has a wonderful collection. So I was able, with the help of some friends and scholars, to really dig deeply to find, you know, just incredibly wonderful correspondence that, you know, on a, on a single day I might be able to look at four different letters just involving one day in their life. So I really got a great picture of what was going on. 
Let me let me begin uh, by asking you about you know the the reception of of the book. Uh, I I do think that um, you know the question of of Marx is something that you know people do have a great deal of, of difficulty with, and so that one of the things that reviews of your book um, you know ha, have done is that many have treated as as you know, taking Marx and the Marx family as kind of quintessential 19th century bohemian cosmopolitan intellectuals. Uh, but it seems that in some ways Marx and his family really are not typical um, in, in this respect and, and perhaps not the most representative of that type. And, and, and also Marx is, is arguably you know, the most important intellectual of his age though any attempt to specify that significance and what his legacy is today also seems very fraught and, 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 um, and, and perhaps even misdirected. So if the Marxes are, are rather atypical case, uh, in some ways of, you know, very bourgeois in their cosmopolitan bohemianism, very, uh, in some ways, you know, that, that, that it's not their personal lives that, that are radical, uh, and if Marx's legacy is utterly fraught, uh, what is the need that your book addresses? I mean, how does your book negotiate that problem? You know. Yeah, I, I think that it's, I, I know what you mean. Some of the reviews have kind of. I, I'm surprised at some of the angles that the. To me, this book is a story of of revolution, of the social revolution that we inherited, that became the 20th century we knew until about. 1989, when Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher started tearing it apart. But I, I feel like Marx's story and his family's story is kind of the story of where our lives came from, our lives meaning Western Europe and the United States, to unions and, you know, mass education and women's rights and and just the, the, the normal freedoms, the liberal freedoms that we take for granted are rooted in that, in the story that I've told you this book, I think, anyway. Mm. Um, but the, the smaller story, of course, the nut of the story is this family. And I don't think at all they were, um, I, I, one, of the, one of the ways Marx has always been described and discredited is that he was a, a bourgeois, you know, intellectual. Mm -hmm. pretending, playing with the working man, you know, pretending to live the life of the worker. And and by no means was he a working class fellow. He was an intellectual. He was middle class. He was from Western Prussia. His, his father was a lawyer. His wife's father was a baron uh, and a government official. But but gradually, in, a, in fact, in a very short time, they had given up all trappings, I, I think, of the bourgeoisie and committed to this thing, which was a cause they both believed in, which was working toward the rights of this working, something called the working class, which didn't even recognize itself as a class as yet. And so I think that part of, I think the idea that the Marx family lived a bourgeois existence um, is not correct. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe that description that was given to him more, more defines the, the sort of Upper class intellectual radicals that were circulating in England at the end of the 19th century, you know, the Webbs, that kind of group, the people in the Fabian Society, and they were sort of um, a lot, a, a lot more cushy in their in their lifestyle, and still working towards the betterment of mankind, etc. But the Marx family, I mean, when you read this book, you really realize when you read their daily letters, they were miserable. They were absolutely poor, dirt poor, and. They had nothing, and you know, and their children died as a consequence, and their marriage suffered as a consequence, and yet through it all, they kept this commitment to this group of people. It was all it was this mission that actually, I think, bound them together during very difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 if if yeah. I may, I mean, I, I I understand what you're saying, but it it does seem to me. I mean, uh, I remember, I, you know, I read one review on Amazon in, in which, you know, the fellow described. Um, you, you know, your, your subject is if you were describing like the 19th century equivalent of the weather underground. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to me to make sense in that respect because it seems to me that people in saying that, I mean, the reason why I, I, I sort of, you know, I said bourgeois intellectual is, is because it seems to me that people want to evade the question of, of the fact that 
that Marx's essential contribution to the 19th century in, you know, revolution was intellectual. Right. You know, that yes, he was not a fighter. He wasn't, he wasn't a street fighter. I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right about that. And the fact of the matter is that he was an intellectual. And in those days, to be an intellectual, you know, with very few exceptions, meant that you had to come from a family of some means in order for you to have gone to school. I mean, sometimes you're struck in reading about the 19th century by how people, people of note, people we know today historically to be important, whether they be writers or artists or philosophers, all knew each other. And I sometimes think, you know, geez, what a small world it must have been. But in fact, it was because that educated universe was very small. There weren't the kind of opportunities for education we have today. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, Marx was in some ways that. But I think this weather underground thing, you know, that would be a stretch. But Hmm. Remember in 1848, when he and his friends had just gone through that revolt, you know, that Europe-wide revolt, mm -hmm. um, and they formed, they, well, actually before this, they formed this small group in Brussels. And it was very much um, not underground, but it was under the radar because they had already, Marx and his wife had been thrown out of France for his political writing, and now they were in Brussels that's kind of hanging on by their toenails because the king was was watching. He wanted to make sure that Marx wasn't going to do anything that would infuriate his much larger neighbor, Prussia. And so it, they had to sort of form this political group that was, was, in a way, underground. It was a sort of a secret organization. Mm -hmm. And then the first political group that Marx was involved with, the first proletariat political group, which became the Communist League, that had to operate as a secret organization in many countries because it would have been illegal. So there was that aspect of this kind of underground organization. Right. But, I mean, you're absolutely right about who Marx was intellectually. No, was I mean, not. I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is that Marx doesn't make a virtue out of out of poverty or out, you know, it, it's, it's what he suffered in order to maintain his commitments. Exactly. No, he would have much rather not been poor, I'm quite sure. Undoubtedly. I mean, he would have much rather that any, you know, no one would suffer that kind of poverty. But, but you're absolutely right. He, in order to do the work he needed to do, he couldn't, do the, he couldn't make a living. Mm -hmm. Let me, I mean, that's at least what he thought. At one point, he said something really funny to a friend of his, that he in no way wanted to become a money-making machine for the middle class. And I mean, there was never any risk of that happening. <laughs> he, he, was, he was much too committed to his work, which was essentially, you know, writing and, um, and working in a library and writing things that, in fact, no one really even wanted to publish. Mm -hmm. Look, let's, let's start with, um, you know, let's, let's dig into some of the, you know, substance biographically uh, that, that, that you relate uh, and, and begin really with the, with the beginning in the sense of, of Marx's uh, early education. Uh, what was the significance of in particular of his relationship to his future father-in-law and of his early university training and how was his wife to be uh, Jenny von Westphalen a factor or central in his early formation in the early formation of, of Marx as an intellectual mm -hmm. well Marx it's, it's critical to remember that Marx and his wife Jenny were both from a town called Trier which is it was in Prussia's westernmost province, the Rhineland, and during, after the French Revolution, and, and until about 18, I think it was from 1806 to about 1813, that region was dominated, was controlled by France under Napoleon. And so people in that area had been introduced to French notions of enlightenment thinking and French revolutionary ideas of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, fair taxation. and. Even though after, eight, so that, that those were the that's the milieu that uh, Jenny and Marx's father's parents were raised in. Um, after 1813, Prussia was strongly in control again. The French had been driven out, and all of the old repressive measures were reinstated. But but that idea, their fathers had been both exposed to the potential that a man could have, and, and significantly a man could have, because in those days women didn't really have rights. Um, the potential that a man could have if he exercised the kind of freedoms that the French Revolution enshrined. And so by the time Marx and Jenny were children, 
these, these, are, these are the household in which they were raised, where outwardly the Prussian crown was served. Uh, Jenny's father was, as I said, a baron, and he was the highest-ranking Prussian official in this town. So he very much towed the official line. But intellectually and in, their, in the privacy of their homes, he was not only reading French thinkers, but he was reading French socialists. And that was a new philosophy that was coming out of France in direct response to um, this nascent industrial system, which would become industrial capitalism. And so he began teaching um, Jenny, who was four years older than Marx, and Marx about these socialists. And it was, a, it was kind of a reassuring philosophy in those days. It wouldn't have been called revolutionary, although I'm sure those people who, who would have been at their interest in it would have been at risk um, if socialist policies had been introduced, probably would have thought it was revolutionary. But it was very, it was a very gentle um, philosophy of it's man's duty to take care of other men in society. Um, and we're, so we're talking about what Fourier, Saint Simon here. Exactly, exactly. And so, and so those were the those were the ideas that they were introduced to as children, or teenagers, I should say. And by the time, by about 1830, in 1830 there was another revolt in France. And this really scared uh, Prussian officials because it was it was a revolt by not only uh, it wasn't just other aristocrats who were you know vying for position or power it was a revolt by this new class of people called businessmen who didn't inherit their money they actually earned it and they wanted to press governments press monarchies to institute new freedoms new political freedoms. You know, and, and get rid of things like um, tariffs between territories and things that would impede industry because they thought that in order to compete in this new world, this new thing that would become capitalism, they needed to have a voice in government. And so in 1830, the, a king was actually overthrown in France and on the throne was put in his place, um, Louis Philippe, who, who actually enjoyed business. That was his pet project. And who, who, saw the, who saw the merits in having wealth coming into state coffers through this new sort of means of, of getting it. It wasn't no longer, it was no longer agricultural based, it was industrial. And so Prussia wasn't ready for that kind of change at all. So they really instituted repressive um, measures and, and clamped down on whatever few freedoms did exist. And at that time, Marx was just going to be graduating from high school. And his father was kind of drawn into this repressive net he was accused of giving a, a subversive speech at a club in Trier. And some people in Marx's school had been, um, had been well, one teacher was sidelined and a student arrested for writing so-called political poetry. Um, and so Marx could feel this, this repressive power from Berlin all the way in Western Prussia. And he understood that um, the freedoms that he'd been taught by Baron Ludwig von Westphalen and by some by his own father actually were meaningless as long as a power as powerful as the king in Prussia were in place. So that was sort of the birth of, that was, that was the beginning of Karl Marx's education. And he went to Bonn and then for a year and then he went to the University of Berlin. Before he left for school, he and Jenny became engaged and from the start, their commitment was a political one. They were in love. You know, they were young lovers, there's no doubt. But she saw in him what she couldn't become because she was a woman in the early 19th century, and that was a potential political player and someone who might help change society for the better. All she could do was provide a backdrop for him. She could provide emotional and, and material support for him, and that was the path she chose. Um, her role actually through the years developed much more and she became a real partner with him and an intellectual sounding board. But, um, but from the very beginning, theirs was a partnership based on this mission. Mm -hmm. And so, in, I mean, in some ways, w what you're describing, I think, is, is something that's, that's very rarely appreciated. Um, it, in some ways, it seems very simple, uh, which is that you know, people speak of the Enlightenment uh, and, the, and the French Revolution as though they were, you know, sort of finished uh, mm. uh, in in the 1830s and 40s, uh, but in some ways, of course, and, and of course, in some ways, you know, the the French Revolution left the genie out of the bottle uh, in a way that um, you know it, it couldn't really be 
um, recorked. But on the other hand, the French Revolution is defeated, and Britain has emerged as a counter-revolutionary force in Europe. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's a highly embattled time um, that that forges Marx's early early life. That's right, because it, you're you're absolutely right. And I guess you know, if you think about his thinking, you know, his his, his thinking is based in Hegel and the idea that you know this continual change. You know, he, he used the ideas of the French Revolution. That was his introduction, um, and he combined it with other ideas and the needs of society change. So. So there is an evolution, and it's always going. It, one one i one one man's new idea is based on another man's old idea, and that's what happened in Marx's case. Somewhere at the very bottom of that would have been these French revolutionary ideas that he learned as a boy. As he grew and as society changed, that evolved. And and you're right, this idea that Britain. I mean, that's what he focused on, which is so interesting. That he used he used industrial Britain, which most people in Europe would have looked to as most powers, most people with uh, money or aspirations would have looked to as the way to go for the rest of Europe because that was where the Industrial Revolution occurred first. Marx looked at that as the laboratory where he could study society, what society's needs would be, and how that society could be reshaped to actually benefit those people who were doing the work who were the, the mass army, the mass industrial army, but were not given either rights, wages, or any privileges whatsoever. Let's let's talk about um, Engels. Um, you know, and, and and as the other sort of key figure, you know, one of the I think one of the strengths of of your book is the way in which it treats you know Marx as as really the project of an entire family as an, of an entire sort of body of associates uh, and that 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 to understand fully you know Marx one needs to think about him in that way in a way that's perhaps distinct from from other thinkers uh, and, and of course, above all, the the intellectual collaboration with Frederick Engels uh, stands out uh, as, in many ways, uh, historically, un, you know, that, 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 that there's nothing quite like that um, in terms of intellectual partnership. Uh, so, to to begin bringing him in, uh, how did Engels and and Marx first meet, and what were the key phases, as you would understand it, through which uh, their friendship passed, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and how, did, how did Engels figure, you know, in, in, a, in a range of ways as sort of the, you know, the greatest friend Marx could have? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it is hard, isn't it, to imagine one of those two men having, either of those two men having the historical impact they have without the other. And they, they would often talk about that through their lives. You know, at various points, there would be people who would accuse Marx of having ruined Engels, or other people would accuse Engels of having ruined Marx, or Marx's family would try to wrest control of Marx. Marx was not, not his immediate family, but his brothers and sisters. Wrest Marx from Engels' malign influence, and vice versa. Engels' family would try to get him away from Marx. But in fact, they really formed a brain and Marx was always a theoretician, and Engels was the material, the material side of their partnership. And they they met in they they met briefly um, when Marx was editing a newspaper in Cologne, but Marx didn't really give Engels any any notice. He thought that Engels was from a group in Berlin called the Free, which were kind of um, second generation, third generation Hegelians who were. A little bit flaky, so so Marx thought. But Engels went off to um, to England to work at his family's. Uh, Engels' father was a, a factory owner in Prussia, and they had a partnership with an uh, English brother, a pair of English brothers named Ehrman, and they had a manufacturing operation in Manchester, which was the heart of industrial Europe. Mm -hmm. And Mark uh, Engels' father sent his son Frederick there. <clears throat> 
when he was 22 to work to learn the business. And Engels, who had had a reputation as being a writer about industrial ills in the Rhineland under a pseudonym, um, was eager to go there because he wanted to learn about this new, this new system in, in the place where it was most advanced. So when he was on, he, he spent about a year there, and when he was on his way back to uh, Prussia, he stopped in Paris where Marx was now working and living. Marx was working as a newspaper editor. And they met at a bar on the, uh, on the, east, on the right bank of the Seine. And they say that the Engels said they talked for 10 days and 10 nights. And what they found was that each had come to the same conclusion concerning society, industrialization, the working class, um, the needs of humanity you know, in the future. They had each come to the same conclusions, but they'd come to them from different ways. Marx had learned about it through books, studying economists. He also had met with um, opposition groups in Paris and workers, kind of radical working groups, of, uh, radical German, German artisans in Paris who formed communist organizations. Um, so Marx had learned some, about it through, through people who'd worked in um, which was own books and people who'd worked but left Prussia. So it was a real opposition universe. Engels had learned about it on the factory floor. So he actually knew the conditions that Marx was theorizing about. And together, um, they formed this unit. So Mar Engels could fill in the gaps in Marx's education. And Engels also had been an artilleryman for a year. And he was a real, there was a real military side to him that he, he actually, he, he loved the military. He loved, uh, following wars and the progress of wars. And, and so he, he had this kind of notion that he would serve someone. And he chose Marx, I believe, as the person he would serve. And so for the rest of his life, from the time he was, let's see, he would have been 1844. I think he was 23 years old when they met. Um, mm. Or no, I'm sorry, he was 24. When they, from the time they met until after Marx's death in 1883, Engels, job was to make sure that Marx had the means um, to work without having to actually get a job. He had, he had the material means to work, which is to save money. Um, he had an intellectual partner that he could bounce all of his ideas against. Um, he had someone who was working within the factory system who could keep him apprised of developments in industrialization so that as Marx was honing his ideas, they would change as, as these developments occurred, as, as technology became better. Um, and so throughout their lives, they, they worked completely um, as one person. Marx, Marx called Engels his alter ego. And in fact, when Marx first moved to England, he got a job working for the New York Tribune as a foreign correspondent, but he didn't speak English. He couldn't speak or write English. Mm -hmm. So he had Engels, Engels write his articles for him. And there are many, many times when Engels' writing is substituted for Marx's, and so much so that after Marx's death, there was a lot of confusion starting out who was the author of what. But mm. oftentimes, also Engels is is in, you know is is writing in you know in a, in ways that are so difficult to trace the first draft, or you know in some you know I think the Communist Manifesto. Yes. You know, is, is, is the ultimate example of that, but, yes. you know, also, Engels you know, wrote, mm -hmm, yeah. go ahead, please. Engels wrote several, Engels wrote several first drafts of that in a catechism form, question and answer form. And finally, um, Marx decided that he was going to do the final draft. And Engels went back to Paris and left Marx in Brussels to work on it. And Marx changed the format, actually at Engels' suggestion. Um, and so when it came out, it was... It actually came out without either of their names on it, but ultimately it was, they were both given, they were given co-authorship. Um, but Marx would say, Engels would say that it was actually Marx's book, that it was his work. Mm -hmm. I think that was a bit of modesty on his part. But, but some of that catechism were, element they, they is preserved. Were, they truly were one, one individual working. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, some of that catechism element is still there where, yes. you know, they say, you know, you accuse us of wanting to abolish the family but the family's already being abolished. You accuse us. That, in the, I believe, the second part. Right. And, and you had asked me about sort, sort of pivotal moments in their relationship, and I think yes, please. one of them occurred in 1851. I'm sorry, in 1850. Um, they, were, they were all in London. All of the, the refugees who had escaped 
the 1848 revolts and the counter-revolution in 1849, a lot of them fled to England because England had sort of a tolerant at, attitude toward um, opposition, continental opposition figures. The British thought that their system was so sound that they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be threatened by you know, this, this shabby bunch coming off boats who couldn't really speak English anyway. So um, Engels was there, Marx was there, and a lot of different groups, Germans, Italians, Hungarians. They were all milling around London waiting for the next big revolt, which of course didn't happen. Um, and in 1850s, they were broke. No, there were so many refugees in town that no one could really find work, and no one would really hire them. So Engels decided to make a sacrifice, and he would leave London and leave this business of revolution in theory to Marx, and he would go back to Manchester and work in his father's factory. And at the time, it was never, I, I can't imagine that he thought he would have done it for so long, but he, he actually worked there for 20 years and throughout that time, he supported the Marx family. And I think um, he would have done a lot more writing on his own, obviously, if he had stayed in London and, and chosen the path that Marx had. But in fact, he made that ultimate sacrifice, which was to become a wage earner, a factory owner, um, in order to keep Marx in food and clothes. Mm -hmm. And in late in life? Late in life. Um, yeah, that, that's another... Uh, because there's a final phase, really, exactly. isn't there? Yeah, they, I call it after Marx. Um, in 1870, Engels moved back to London, and by that time, Marx had been... Um, he'd written Capital, but it had to little or no acclaim. Um, it was published in Germany, um, although it was, it was uh, translated in Russia and did very well. Um, and Marx was kind of slowing down a bit. Um, and Engels arrived just in time. The Paris Commune had erupted in Paris, and Marx was the head of the International Working Men's Association, and they, the International was actually accused, and Marx directly was accused, of orchestrating the Commune. So he had um, not only a lot of correspondence with newspapers and you know, shooting down rumors and um, accusations that he had to take care of, but he had a lot of refugees coming looking for help in London um, who were escaping the commune. Engels had arrived in London just in time to help him with that. So the two men actually then started physically splitting their work. Uh, they were both theoreticians. They were both uh, politicians. They were both revolutionaries. After Marx died in 1883, um, he had promised before his death to have three volumes of Capital ready for a publisher. And there was always this notion of a fourth volume floating around. But by the time of his death, he'd only actually completed the first volume. But what, what Engels discovered was that Marx had completed many volumes, um, but they weren't actually finished. He had several, several versions of volume two, several versions of volume three, and, in, and they were in various states of um, completion. Mm -hmm. So Engels, once again, put aside any work that he might have done personally, his own writing, to make sure that Marx's last two volumes of Capital were published. And he also set about um, translating and editing dozens of earlier pieces, because now, after, after Marx's death, socialism had sort of become more um, part of the political mainstream throughout Western Europe, and so there was a greater demand for Marx's writing. And so it fell to Engels, after Marx's death, to continue this work, not his own work, but once again, the work of his friend. So he, also, he really did, throughout his life, sacrifice everything um, so that Marx's work and his writing could be disseminated to the greatest number of people around the world. And, and in fact, he never really did get around to doing the things that he, he himself wanted to do. Well, let me ask you, you know, I mean, the, the, last, um, you know the, the last of the key characters in your book are, are Marx's daughters. And in many ways, um, you know, Marx's relationship to them, of course, is parental, but it, you know, it, it has dimensions of his relationships to his wife and to his friend in the sense that it's a deeply intellectual relationship that he has with his daughters, um, who in many ways assist him with his work and, and of course, all become, you know, hopelessly radicalized themselves. 
uh, at a very young age. Uh, so, c- could you describe, you know, uh, you know, both, you know, briefly their their trajectories, but more importantly, you know, how do we, you know, how, it, it, one of the things that most impresses me about the biography is the way in which. You know, you get this sense of someone whose intimate life and closest personal relationships all have this profoundly intellectual dimension um, that really is the glue. Uh, revolution, you know, intellectual and, you know, politically revolutionary. Um, and that even goes uh, for his children as much as he wanted sort of a respectable existence uh, for them. So... Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit about his daughters. Yeah, you're really right about that, the, the intellectual dimension of, of the family's life. In fact, when I was working on the book, so many times I would stop and think, oh, I'm so lucky to be able to spend so much time with such smart people because the, the lives they lived were, were really lives of the mind. The, the, I, I think at one point I talk about the daughters having an education that any sort of British middle class girl would have had, you know, they learned languages, they learned music, they did paintings, they um, went to a, a, a ladies' school, um, but they had this incredible education at home from one of the greatest minds of the Western world, and he, he raised them as he would have raised a boy. He raised them completely intellectual, completely radicalized as revolutionary. He he had, his evenings could be spent discussing all of these things with his daughters. As you say, they helped him with his writing. They were only a few of a handful of people who could ever read his writing. Um, they transcribed his articles. They, they were completely committed to their father's ideals and goals. And in fact, part of the problem was that, as you say, Marx wanted them to have a life outside of revolution because he said that his mother, his wife's life had been wrecked by his choice of life, that he watched her suffer, watched, you know, they had to bury four children, four of seven children. They'd lived in, you know, dire poverty for, for such a long time despite Engel's best efforts. And he didn't want to see his daughters suffering that same fate. And yet there could have been no other possibility because that's the world they lived in. That's the world they inherited. And they wouldn't have been satisfied or in fact even recognized a bourgeois existence with, you know, a, a lawyer or a, a, a doctor, although one of them did marry a doctor, but he turned into a revolutionary. Um, so anyway, the, the three daughters, Jenny, Laura, and Eleanor, um, each were, Jenny was a really wonderful journalist. She had a brief spell as an independent journalist in the next, actually worked to free Irish prisoners who were being held for political crimes um, in British jail, and her articles caused, uh, uh, resulted in a parliamentary inquiry and the fact and the free and the release of these prisoners. Laura, the middle daughter, was the most traditional, and she married, as I said, a doctor, a, Cu- a Cuban-born doctor who was uh, from of French descent, and he though dallied in revolution. He he was kind of a, a wonderful character in a way because he was very high-spirited and very melodramatic, but he never did anything very well, including being a revolutionary. And so she suffered the fate that her mother did, only worse, because while Marx was at least brilliant and, and shared his life with his wife, um, Paul Lafargue, who Laura married, was not a very brilliant man and was completely chauvinistic, I, I, I think, in the way he treated Laura. He didn't really include her in any of his political activities. and so. This woman who had been given, you know, uh, training as, as a, you know, a radical who knew the ins and outs of every economic theory, who could talk about any political situation in Europe, was, was in this household of hers, her married household, left to sit and raise children, who then died one, two, three within two years, while she and her husband were on the run after the commune. Mm-hmm. Um, the third daughter, Eleanor, I think, is the most important historically because. She, she waged a fight. The evolution of the working man and the revolt of uh, the political kind of evolution of the 19th century went from the intellectual of like Marx at the beginning of the century to eventually, after, the 18, after 1860, 
it, it kind of was handed over to the working men themselves. So in other words, the working men were now organized and educated enough that they didn't need intellectuals like Marx leading them. And so the fight that Eleanor, Marx's youngest daughter, became involved in was a trade union fight involving these very workers. And she was really a committed and passionate um, advocate. And, and unfortunately for her, she became involved with a really disreputable man who was a socialist and aspiring playwright, who, but an absolute scoundrel. And she ended up killing herself. Um, for personal reasons, but I think it was just also fatigue because she'd been fighting battles for so long and she she joined her father in battle. From the time she was a young girl, when she was eight years old, she was writing to people about French revolutionaries and Polish rebellion. And I remember I came across a little notebook she she had as a, as a girl. and mm-hmm. It's um, written in crayon or whatever the equivalent of crayon was at that time of the 19th century. She wrote the words tutti frutti and then inside this notebook, she had long articles about sewage systems and uh, and uh, industrialization in France, and you know, so so her her she was a child, but she was a child immersed in this world of the worker and of her father. So I think by the time she killed herself, she was just emotionally and physically exhausted. But the daughters were really fascinating, and they and they did they were part of if if the if the business of the Marx household was revolution, social revolution, they were the inner circle. You know, they were on the general staff. Mm-hmm. Let, uh, let's talk about um, Marx himself uh, a, a bit here. In particular, uh, as, revolution, as a revolutionary, he and Ingalls, as revolutionaries of 1848, um, and in some ways the most famous revolutionaries of 1848 um, but in in other ways 1848 itself is scarcely known uh, or understood uh, by by so many and and of course the the revol- they had little they didn't have a, a great deal to do uh, with the revolution of 1848 at least not in in Paris at its epicenter um, so describe the you know the the period of, of, of kind of the crystallization of Marx's thought, you know, we've already addressed that somewhat, uh, you know, arriving in Paris, um, you know, but perhaps, uh, you know, a, a, a bit more of a sense of, of that time in Paris as a young man uh, with his new bride and, uh, you know, and important budding relationships, Ingalls, but also the old poet Heine and others. Uh, but. You know, and also, but the significance, crucially, um, you know, of 1848. How did Marx and Engels experience 1848, and what did it mean to them later on? Okay, okay. Well, um, Marx arrived in Paris in 1843. He he'd been working as a the editor of a of a so-called democratic newspaper in Cologne, which meant that it had been funded by businessmen and was um, giving voice to this notion that. In order for business to grow, people had to have greater freedoms, and monarchs had to allow for uh, a constitution and a parliament that actually had political power. So Marx, that's, Marx was editing that newspaper in Cologne, but of course his ideas evolved and became more radical, and eventually the newspaper was banned. So a fellow he would met uh, who was editing another newspaper in Dresden um, had an idea of opening an opposition newspaper in Paris that would join the voices of French and German opposition writers. And in Paris at that time, it was there was relative free speech, as long as, I suppose, one didn't threaten the government of Louis Philippe directly. And so um, Marx and Jenny moved to Paris, and this was, they had just been married for several months, and they uh, had never been anywhere outside of Prussia, except to go to Switzerland on their honeymoon. And so they walked into this, or they rolled into in a in a carriage into this city that was wild and vibrant with ideas. I mean, the the idea of, of nationalism, socialism, democracy. Um, this Paris was always viewed by Europeans as a place where revolution was born. It was it was the philosophical seat of a political philosophy, I should say, because I think that in many ways Berlin would have been the philosophical seat of of, of Europe, but political philosophy and the revolutions 
were born in Paris. And so they arrived and it was wild. Um, writers and artists and musicians all went to the same salon. Marx and Jenny frequented salons that included some of the names that, you know, we all know, Victor Hugo, George Sand, um, um, the painter Eng. You know, they were, they were all there and they were all talking. And artists at that time, interestingly, had had just begun to have to support themselves. They no longer had rich patrons. Um, and so this, they suddenly learned, they suddenly found their political voices as well because now they were fending for themselves. Marx called them and himself head workers, where workers, uh, laborers might have been called hand workers, but he felt they were all in the same boat. They were also in Paris at that time. Um, a lot of workers who were exiled from Germany and other places throughout Europe who had gotten into some political trouble at home and so they set up shop in Paris and they, there were a lot of underground organizations sprouting in Paris at the time building on these French revolutionary ideas and also some new ideas about communism and communism at that time was basically seen as um, as like socialism except that it uh, called for elimination of private property um, so Marx arrived at this place where, unlike Prussia, where you couldn't say anything without getting thrown in jail, here you could say virtually anything and anyone. You, you could do whatever you'd like, and that freedom was overwhelming. So, of course, uh, he, started an, he started working for this newspaper, but the newspaper went under after one issue, and it was so uh, advanced that it uh, resulted in uh, arrest warrants, not arrest warrants, but charges of treason in Prussia for uh, Marx and several other people who were involved in the newspaper. So while Marx was without a job, he started meeting with opposition figures from around Europe, and he also started studying economists. And at, in 1844 was when Marx's economic ideas were actually, the base of them were formed. They were honed over the years as capitalism changed, and his ideas grew too. But that was where the formation of them was. By the time he left Paris, he was then thrown out of Paris a year later because he had written um, for another newspaper in Paris, and it was uh, insulting to the King of Prussia. In fact, it, it was seen as advocating regicide, and so uh, France threw him out. Um, and a group of Marxist colleagues who had who had come to know in Paris, they all traveled to Brussels. Jenny went happily along with him. In Brussels, um, the group that would always become known as, the, would always be thought of as the Marx Party began to be formed. And this was really the base of his international organization. Um, it was a combination of intellectuals and proletariat, um, mostly artisans, uh, mostly of Prussian or German background. And, and so now Marx was building on the economic ideas he discovered in Paris, but he was also becoming more radicalized politically. And by 1848, he was still in Brussels when these revolutions throughout Europe erupted. And this, this, these revolts of this year were and are still the only European-wide revolts against, by the people against their government. And at the base of them was, they were very much like the Arab Spring that we just experienced. People who were seen as powerless finally rose up against kings and, in the case of Arab Spring, dictators who not only denied them immediate freedom, but denied them a future because they couldn't see that the world was changing around them and that they and society had to change with it. And so Europe had been undergo a suffering famine and terrible egg harvests for several years. And at the same time that the farming sector was um, uh, depressed, industrialization was revving up. And, but the people who were getting jobs were the women and children who would work very little. And the men who had been displaced off the farms weren't necessarily finding jobs in industry. Um, and then there was the whole destruction of the social safety net that had been in place for generations um, in, in rural areas. That was gone when people moved into cities. So people were desperate. They had no hope. They had no food. They had no future. And at a certain point, intellectuals like Marx and students who had education but also didn't think they had a future because there were no jobs, and businessmen who thought that this old system of monarchy was not, um, was not meeting the needs of society, joined forces um, to confront the kings uh, of Europe. And 
they had this, their numbers were vastly increased when the millions of disgruntled workers and agriculturalists joined them. And so throughout Europe, there was a seemingly spontane spontaneous eruption of revolt. The epicenter, of course, was Paris. Marx was in Brussels when it erupted, but he quickly went to Paris to be part of it. And then he quickly went back to Germany, back to Prussia, because that's where he wanted um, to stage a revolt. So let me just, uh, Mary, let me just interrupt you for one second. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and then I want to, I want to hear about uh, Marx in Germany. But I, I shouldn't forget to remind our listeners that uh, you are listening to WHPK 88.5 FM, the pride of the South Side. And to also let them know that when you are a mentor, there are a lot of things that you can do together. But sometimes the most important thing you can do with a child is just spend time together, be a friend, be a mentor, just be there. Go to bigbrothersbigsisters.org. And also, uh, do you want to be a real-life superhero? Well, you can just by donating blood. Did you know that one pint of blood can save up to three lives? Donating blood is a real way to make a big difference. Visit www.bloodsaves.com to find out more. Okay, now I'm sorry for that interruption, Mary. So no, I'm sorry. I, I, I get carried away. <laughs> that's okay. No, no, I, 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 you know, I have to do these. Um, the so so Marx has left uh, Brussels and, and and he's in Cologne, right? Yes, he left Brussels, went to Paris, stayed there briefly, and then went to Cologne and resumed his work as a newspaper editor hmm. because he thought that he, he was always actually, I guess you could call him a propagandist more than you could call him a revolutionary during this time because he felt that um, that was the quickest and easiest way to reach the greatest number of people. I sometimes wonder what he would do in our day today with, you know, the Internet. I, he, I, I can't imagine if he would have been thrilled to have this kind of um, technology at his fingertips. But uh, so he, he began his newspaper work again. But once again, you know, Europe was still erupting because even though the kings from, from Germany to France to Switzerland to Austria to Italy fell quickly and with relative little violence, the counter-revolution kicked in almost immediately as soon as the kings found their footing again because they were really thrown off guard by, by the revolt. The counter-revolution came down um, swift and, 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 and with, well, with a great deal of brutality because the kings were able to enlist the support of the industrialists and the upper middle classes who were terrified now that this very numerous lower class was actually going to be able to demand their rights. Um, so while Marx was working as a newspaper editor, he was watching this evolution. And it was really during that year that Marx's political ideas were born. So if his economic ideas were born in 1844, his political, the political Marx was born in 1848 because he saw that men, working men, will only achieve their goals and only win their rights when they do it themselves. They can't rely on someone else, whether that be a liberal government, a so-called liberal government, or it be um, a beneficent industrialist who, who says he's looking out for them, that they actually have to form their own political parties, organize as trade unions, um, organize as, as men, as a class of men, which we call the working class. And so that's really the nucleus of, of Marx's philosophy, political philosophy. It was born out of those revolutions. We've just got a few more minutes left. Um, and, and so, you know, again, I, w I want to, you know, raise this question of, of, of biography. And, you know, in some ways, the almost the inconceivability of this type of life, not because these were superheroes, uh, but because uh, the political context within which they lived, you know, and, and the abil their ability to kind of re to, to, to participate in the ongoing modern revolution, um, you know, it, it seems to us so uh, distant. Um, and also I want to raise the question of the way in which biography is used against them and how you've handled this question. Uh, because very often, you know, Marx and Engels are treated as biographically as hypocritical. Um, 
you know, in a com- it's been a commonplace method of, of discrediting uh, them. So that Engels is, you know, discredited for being a capitalist, and Marx is discredited for, you know, his concern for bourgeois respectability where his daughters were concerned. Um, you know, how do how do these sorts of criticisms really miss the mark in the sense that how do our own conceptions of the relationship between our personal lives and our political intellectual lives really differ from those of Carl and Jenny Marx and their friend Ingalls mm-hmm. and their children? Well, let, let me answer the question about the, mm-hmm. how, how Marx and Ingalls are presented by other biographers and, as hypocrites first, and then I'll get into the other one. I think that, I think what I tried to do was, um, I think I tried to give the readers, and one of the reasons I did it chronologically, which is a very old-fashioned way of writing biography these days, is that I really wanted to give the reader a sense of living Marx and Jenny's and the children's and Engel's life, you know, hearing their words, living their day-to-day existence, and letting the reader themselves decide you know what what are their what are their motivations you know are they true are they um are you know is marx as as he was accused from the time of his own life until after you know into the 20th century was marx living off the working man um you know really to see and hear them in their most intimate conversations which is through their letters what they what they said and felt and 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 experienced and i think some people have come away from the book and said, oh, my God, he was a terrible man. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll never think of Marxism in the same way. You know, he was a scoundrel. I actually came away from the book really deeply respecting Marx and Engels and Jenny and the sacrifices they made for people they didn't really even know. You know, they could have had a very comfortable existence. You know, Marx was an upper class or a middle class intellectual. He could have been a university professor somewhere, he could have been a scholar, a writer, a well-respected member of the community, but they chose the most difficult possible path, working against a system that had been entrenched for centuries. You know, it wasn't just that they were trying to get someone out of political office. They were working against absolute monarchs who said they were God's emissaries on earth. So they they picked this enormously difficult job. and I think that I, I came, after looking at their daily lives over, you know, 80 years, I, I could only come away with a great deal of respect. And, and I think that um, the people who call them hypocrites, you know, might have their own, they might have, you know, they might be coming from their own politi- particular political angle. I mean, Undoubtedly. Uh, I know, yeah, so so I think it's just I think that in anything, you know, you know, do you remember the the writer I F I F Stone of course. used to actually go to congressional hearings and listen to what was being said instead of reading the summaries produced by congressional aides afterwards, and you know the the difference between actually experiencing something or reading reading um, uh, a, a letter, an actual original letter, the difference between that and hearing an interpretation of it, you know, is is enormous and I think that if anyone has any questions about Marx and who he was and what he meant then you should just go read him don't read what someone says about him even me you know read Marx's work I offer this book as a biography as as a way into Marx so that when you read Capital you read the Communist Manifesto you understand what he was experiencing at that time who he was and the milieu in which he lived, you know, the political situation in which he lived, what was going on around him, what the bigger picture was. So I think that, I think that that's, that's the difference, and that's the approach to biography that I took, and that's why I thought it was important to write a biography of Marx, because there's been so much misinformation um, about him that it would be, I just thought it was good to start from scratch again and int- reintroduce the man as in his own words and, and as in, in the words of those around, immediately around him. Um, so, as for mm-hmm. the commit, as for the, the idea that these were these were particular times and that these two these people Jenny and Marx were involved in a revolution we could never fight, I think on the contrary we're at that exactly that same moment again, a crucial jun- juncture where entrenched interests uh, of government and business aren't willing to change to meet society's needs and that. There are people like Marx and Jenny out there who are working. You know, we don't know about them. In fact, a lot of people didn't know about them at the time. Very few did. 
It's just that these things take a long time, and that's something that Marx understood and always stressed, that revolution isn't something that happens in a day or a week. It takes decades. And when you're in the middle of those decades, it's sometimes very difficult to recognize. You know, I want to...